Uh, first off, uh, I'd like to thank, I'd like to congratulate Coach and thank Coach Johnny Harris for uh, just an unbelievable uh, win last yesterday afternoon, and and then and then also thank the Auburn family for an incredible turnout. Um, thank the team for playing with toughness and courage, um, and 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 also thank the depart uh, the Auburn athletic department and the marketing crew. Uh, we've had South Carolina and Tennessee and, and, and now LSU former champions come into Neville Arena before, but this felt different. The lines uh, before the game, and yeah, maybe some were here to see the defending national champion and some of their star players, but they obviously came away incredibly impressed and what a tremendous accomplishment. Um, you know, second thing, uh, happy Martin Luther King Day. Um, I am, you know, grateful for the work that Dr. King did. Uh, and as a coach and a teacher, I try to remind my players to take advantage of the opportunities that their fathers didn't have. Um, there still is racism in this country, but my student athletes are in a lot better position to take advantage of the American dream, um, than their fathers and their grandfathers were. And, uh, my job is to encourage them and teach them. Uh, to do that, to do exactly that. Um, uh, Vanderbilt uh, is uh, right now is sits at the bottom of our league, um, and um, and you know all I can do is see them in a two point loss at Memphis, and uh, being in a, in a last possession or two game against Alabama. Um, watch them go on the road to LSU and. You know, beat and compete, and be be in the game the whole time. Watch them, you know, you know, in a close game with Ole Miss at Ole Miss. You know, just uh, and knowing that last year we went there and got beat, um, and uh, you know, so obviously we have a lot to play for. Um, I will try to explain to our guys that um, a little bit about Auburn basketball history, and I'm going to remind our guys that. Prior to us having won five out of the last six, we had lost 13 straight to Vanderbilt. That's just not that far ago. Not, that's not that long ago. Um, so, um, you know, obviously, uh, um, you know, we're going to work really hard to prepare. Um, Mannion is uh, Ezra, Ezra Mannion will be the fastest, quickest, most athletic, smallest guard that we'll play against all year long. Um, he is the best uh, undersized guard that I think I've ever seen score over size. It doesn't matter who he gets switched up on. It doesn't matter what his matchup is. He is going to go downhill, and he's going to find a way to score with either hand at a, at a decent percentage, I mean, tough shot up to tough shot, but they're not for him. Um, and uh, obviously, he made that last bucket against us last year. Um, Vanderbilt is patient. Um, they just, you know, they'll 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 get you in a situation, which I think has been a little bit of a challenge for us, um, in the sense that we're going to get a good first shot against Vanderbilt. We will. But if you take that good first shot, you're going to come down the other end and cover for 30 seconds. And then you're going to go down the other end, you're going to get a good first shot. If you take that, you're going to, you're going to come down the other end, you're going to guard for 30 seconds. And it's going to be a close game. We haven't had many close games. Um, and the interesting thing, and one of the things I'm also going to talk to the team about today is, who's going to be out there late? question is, who's going to be out there late? And the answer is most likely, if I know myself, my best defensive players. If I know myself, and we haven't had many moments, but in those moments, that's who I tend to go to. So that may answer the question for who's going to be out there. Um, whereas Vanderbilt or when Ole Miss comes in Saturday or at Mississippi, at Alabama and at Mississippi State, our next four games, I would anticipate all four of them being much closer and us being involved in situations that we've hardly been involved in this year. So 
um, those are the kind of things that we're preparing for. How could you possibly have any questions after <laughs> after all that? It's kind of early into conference play here. You guys are three and zero. Alabama's three and zero. Samford's fifteen and two. Troy's playing great basketball. Like what? I guess if you had to kind of look at like the the state of basketball in Indiana, I'm in Alabama. Whoops. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the where kind of is your head at? Yeah. Looking at that. Yeah, man. I I know it sounds crazy, but I'm definitely proud of of uh, the state of basketball in Alabama. I'm I am. I'm proud of it. Um, I mean. Between Auburn and Alabama, in four of the last five years, we've been the champions. You know, I mean, and I don't think the SEC, quite frankly, um, has done enough to really promote that. Like sometimes when I say that, do you remember reading that? I don't remember reading that in Sports Illustrated. I don't remember. I remember reading, reading times when Auburn and Alabama won four out of the five SEC championships, but not in basketball. Um, but that's that's in the past, you know. We just we'll see what we can do right now. You know, it's a, I'm trying to make history in the future, and that's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. I think Tennessee and Kentucky and Ole Miss and you know a few other teams in our league will have something to say about it as well as Auburn and Alabama. Um, but yeah, I mean, the job that our coaches in the league are doing at Sanford and Troy and UAB and South Alabama and you know North Alabama and Alabama Huntsville and you know, Tusculum and Alabama and m Alabama State, I, it's pretty pretty strong, pretty strong. Rich, I asked you about this after the game the other night, but the free throw shooting for y'all, y'all are top 50 in the country right now in free throws. This is, could be your best free throw shooting team in a while. Just, I want to ask you a little bit more about how much you've seen these guys in particular work to get better, because there's several guys on this team that have had pretty big jumps in yeah. their free throw, free throw percentages this season alone. Well, I mean, one of the keys to being a good free throw shooter team is to get your pre best free throw shooters there. So, you know, the final four year, you know, Bryce Brown and Jared Harper went to the line a lot, and that helped our percentage. You know, that's not necessarily the case at one and two for me right now. And so now my three-man, you know, uh, Chad Baker's getting there more. Jalen Williams as a four man's getting more. And Dylan and Janai are always going to get there because, you know, we go through them a lot. And, uh, you know, I can't compliment Dylan and Janai enough for their effort. Um, they have both not only worked at their free throw stroke, but studied it, but, but filmed it, but adjusted it, have given it significant thought. Um, Dylan probably the biggest turnaround even from a standpoint of just flat out you know, changing his stroke completely um, and and good for him um, you know um, <laughs> you try the same thing over and over again expecting a different result the definition of that is not a very complimentary word and D Dylan had tried the same thing over and over again for a while but really to his credit and in Janai he's got a good stroke there are some things uh, in that stroke that that needed to take place for him to feel better about it, um, and that's going to be a key for us to be able to continue to win close games. Coach, there's been a lot of talk about um, Trey improving over you know this season and or this season last season. When he came out of high school, you know, coming off of a state championship run, playing under Coach Ward, just kind of what was he like? What, what were you getting in him straight out of high school uh, when, he, when he arrived here? Well, I mean, I think straight out of high school, we were getting a football player that was playing point guard a little bit more than we are right now. Trey, Trey, Trey Donald's a point guard. Um, and, you know, I, I continue to point to Trey and Aiden um, as, you know, the leaders of our team as it relates to our backcourt. Valuing possessions, they both got almost a three-to-one assist turnover ratio, and um, which means that they value possessions, uh, and they've trusted their teammates to also, you know, get the ball ahead and you know let some of those other guys make some plays, and they'd be willing to take the hockey assist, but not put the ball in positions on the floor where they turn the ball over so much, um, and um, you know I think that um, you know Trey obviously uh, has, you know he has improved. Um, and just like at so many positions on the floor, 
we, we're, we don't drop off when we go to the bench. And that second unit has been really effective defensively. And that second unit has been better defensively than the first and the starters. And that's really helped us. First, going back to Malik Dunbar, Javon McCormick, now Chad, you guys have had some really high-impact JUCO players, I guess. What's the difference between the evaluation process for a, for a guy who's you know, a, a D1 yeah. transfer versus a JUCO guy, and how do you think you guys have done so yeah. well in terms of evaluation? Well, one of the things about the transfer portal that I think is a, is a, is a, a positive thing Look, I believe in the opportunity our country presents and provides for people. And I think, you know, I transferred from Milwaukee to Tennessee and transferred from Tennessee here in many ways and, um, you know, southern Indiana to Milwaukee. And so the opportunity to move and, and move up, so it's just a great thing. Um, I personally am in favor of a one-time transfer. Um, I am. Um, and I think that... Uh, I think the reason why I'm in favor of that is I just think it's great for you know, kids to have that opportunity two times uh, in a career. Um, now you begin to wonder whether or not we're teaching the kids to flee, not fight. Um, but as it relates to transfer decisions, um, the best way to evaluate whether or not somebody's going to be successful in your program is to watch them against the best competition. So when I studied Chad Baker at San Diego State, Duquesne, uh, and in junior college winning a national championship uh, for a good friend of mine um, out in Florida, um, Coach DeMeo, um, I got a chance to see him be coached at the high level, and I got to see him compete at the high level. So we've made transfer evaluation decisions based on really good film study, just film study, not watching the, necessarily in an AAU tournament or certainly not watching against in their high school where the competition is so different. Can't get a good evaluation watching a kid play in high school. He's better than everybody else on the floor. He's better than everybody he plays with. That's not the case when they come out here and play for the sixth, seventh, or eighth man, right? So I, I, uh, that's been – and that's something that I probably I, – I don't really love recruiting. I don't. Um, there's a lot of things about it I don't like. Um, but I love the evaluation process. I do. I really love to watch the ball, both in the gym and on tape. Bruce, when you guys have played. My, my staff has done a very good job. With, with My staff and I have done a really good job making some of those evaluation decisions with mid-major guys, junior college guys, Division II guys. I, think, I, don't, and I don't think we've gotten one wrong. In, in three or four years. It's hard to do. Bruce, when you guys have played uh, Coach Stackhouse's teams at Vanderbilt, they're usually, no matter what the record is, they're usually really close games, really tight games. What is it about his teams and these Vanderbilt teams that you feel like you know, well, make them so tough? Well, he's one of the best offensive coaches in the country because he was a pro. Um, he, was a, he, was, he was a really good pro coach. Jerry, Jerry Stackhouse could coach in the NBA right now and be very successful. And I, In fact, I, I would imagine that's where he's going to, I would imagine he's going to be there someday again because he was. Uh, he got a phenomenal offensive mind. And as a player and a competitor, he was about as tough a player as there was on the floor. Everybody was afraid of Jerry Stackhouse, period, because he was physical, tough, and he would take your head off. And he still he coaches that way. Uh, he competes that way. Um, and, you know, that's, that, that stuff just wins. That and because he may not be always as talented sometimes, um, you know, this year they're not quite as talented. Um, they're going to be patient. And so they're going to be patient. Um, they also, you know, foul the least. And they also send teams to the foul line the least. So he doesn't give you easy ones. Uh, doesn't foul you. And then makes you, makes you, um, his team is patient. Run the shot clock down, lower possessions, therefore closer game. They don't turn the ball over, so you can't get offense out of your defense. And they change defenses enough to try to confuse you, but also to get you to shoot early. You shoot early and miss, then go down and, again, go down there and guard for 30 seconds. And shoot early and miss. The next thing you know, you know, it's six at halftime. You know? And then all of a sudden, you get in a game, and you're at Vanderbilt, and it's late. And they look up at the clock and go, you know what? We're only down a couple possessions. 
And you, you, you sit there and go, well, God, we should be beating these guys by 12. And you're not. And that's how they steal a couple. 